Here on Real Resilience, you typically, or I guess for the past couple of weeks, what you guys have experienced are some motivational, inspirational leaders and public speakers and innovators in their industry with Shabon Mayer and Terry Fossum. And that has been really cool. It has been a lot of fun. One of the things that I appreciated with last week with Terry was that he got a bit more tangible. But what I am most excited about for this week is that we're, I think that we're going to get a lot more tangible. We're going to get a lot more tactile with how kind of a theoretical philosophical approach turns into practical guidance and practical, not even guidance, it's very structured into the resilience world and how we can turn resilience into actual tangible tools that you can touch and you can implement and you can see the difference. So I'm excited. We have today, Dr. Gene Coughlin. All right. Yeah. Sweet. I was like, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's right. Something I should have figured out before the show, but that's okay. So Dr. Gene, you have started a program which I haven't taken, but I am in, we've talked about it to a pretty extensive extent. And it's something that I have I've fallen in love with. I've fallen in love with the idea and the practical use in the real world and the big actions that you and your company are taking to push it to the next level, to get it to the most people as you possibly can to make the biggest difference that we could see in the world. So please tell us about this program. What is it called? What is its purpose? So it's called the Resilience Building Leader Program, and we we got started in 2018. From 2018 to about midway through 2019, we did research, job task analysis, where we ask folks working in a variety of industries what they were doing as leaders to build and lead resilient teams. And my interest in this came from research that I did to earn my doctorate at Pepperdine University where I did research and wrote on the idea of collective resilience. And so we know that individuals can be resilient, but the fact is that teams and even organizations can also be resilient. So for this research that we did in 2018, early part of 2019, we asked these leaders, what specific tasks are you doing? What leader tasks are you executing in the workplace to build and lead resilient teams? And of course, we had to define what a resilient team was. And so we defined it as a team that can overcome, work together to overcome adversity and then adapt and grow as a result of that adversity. This is sort of doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. And mainly we started this research prior to the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis highlighted, if you will, the need for collective resilience. But we did this research and what we got back was a lot of data that we then crunched And we came up with 29 big leader tasks, actionable things, a taxonomy of 29 leader tasks that are executable in the workplace. And we grouped those into five separate competency domains, create a positive climate, develop cohesion, provide purpose, facilitate team learning and support organizational learning. And then we mapped those domains to three levels of leadership within organizations, frontline supervisors, middle managers, and senior leaders. And that became the basis of the Resilience Building Leader Program. That, I love, you see oftentimes online today in the social media space, you'll see a lot of people that are, I don't want to say hawking. Some of them are hawking and some of them are looking to provide real true value. And the term resilience, I feel like really picked up steam. When would you say that resilience? I'll tell you, uh, the term resilience picked up steam in the aftermath of the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks in New York City. And so after After that, the term resilience was gaining popularity. At first, it was the New Yorkers are showing resilience. Exactly. And then the entire American public. And then as the military personnel were deploying overseas and getting involved in this, what became known as the global war on terrorism at the time, 
Then there was talk of very personnel and their families being resilient in the face of continuous deployment. So that's when the term really picked up. And in fact, the American Psychological Association at that time did some research. They even produced a documentary with the Discovery Channel talking about this idea of resilience. So it hit the American lexicon, really picked up steam in the aftermath of, of the September 11th attacks. That makes sense because I don't want to lose the thread that I had before and I might, but we'll roll the dice. We'll see what happens. When I was in the army, I became a master resilience trainer. And that was through the military's identification that building. And what's interesting is that this wasn't team. It had 0% to do with teams. It was 100% the individual. And it was really about the focus of the training and all of the kind of practical exercises that they had built in to for the people that are training to become the master resilience trainers for their units was about the integration or the smoothing of the transition back and forth between free life and home life. Right. And so that's where they saw a lot of people, you're downrange, your wife has an answer to call in three days and you start catastrophizing. And so it's like, okay, how do we, what tools can we implement? And they created some really cool tools. None of them had to do with teams. And right. I think that's uh, getting back to the point that I was at before was that a lot of people are online creating programs for people. I don't know how robust the specific resilience training space is. There are some people there. A lot of it is life coaching and stuff where they teach somewhat similar principles. But I think the difference, obviously the main difference that we were just highlighting is that you focus on teams within organizations and their performance. And the reason that I thought about this was the high level and structured nature in which you came up with in order to distribute this. You have the 29 leader tasks broken down into the five, what were the five five competency domains the five competency domains and then in there then you didn't even just leave it there okay these are great and we broke it down to five competency domains of these 29 tasks You're like no we need to form this into a specific manner because there are different levels of leaders Map it to the different levels of leadership exactly so was this How did you come up with the idea? Obviously, you've been doing a ton of research, but was this just built together in your mind over time? Or did you sit down with a team or even by yourself with a whiteboard? I'm going to lay something out that's comprehensive and that's going to make a big difference. Yeah, it came. First of all, let me go back to the training that the military is doing, specifically that training that you received. That is, that's very good training. The military has done an excellent job at teaching and building individual resilience skills. Those programs were based on research that was done at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Dr. Martin Seligman and his team there did an extensive amount of research on that. And they, you know, the chief of staff of the army at the time, General Casey, reached out to the University of Pennsylvania and said, listen, we want to develop a program here in the the Army. We want it to be based on solid research. We like the work that you're doing there, and we want to see how applicable that is. And so they worked together and they developed a program that I think has been quite successful. That was the same approach that we took. I had done some research on this idea at Pepperdine while I was earning my doctorate in education on the idea of collective resilience. And that sort of gave us the impetus. And then we, from that, we conducted additional research. So it's interviews with with leaders in a variety of different industries. So none of this, what the University of Pennsylvania came up with was based on research. It wasn't the good ideas of Dr. Seligman or anyone on his staff. These were driven concepts that they that were validated. So the same with us. It's this is not the Dr. Gene Coglin's program. This is a I simply asked the questions and then pulled in the data. And then made sense of I made sense of that data. When how all of these leader tasks that we're hearing, how do we bucket these into different groups to create competency domains? Which tasks are related to each other? That's how we came up with competency domains. And then after that, it was okay. When do leaders uh, in organizations really start embracing those specific leader tasks? When do they, because obviously a frontline supervisor doesn't do the same thing as a senior leader. They have different roles. So it was, it, it, I don't want to say it was easy, but it was following the typical research protocols and processes for how to develop, to develop this. Absolutely. And I'll point out that the, the kind of, I tell folks that 
you know, the individual resilience training that folks are getting in the military services or in other places is very good, but it's similar to teaching the, the players of a basketball team individual skills, what they do individually. And that's all great. That's a starting point. That's how young people, young boys and girls learn to play basketball. But eventually you need to integrate those skills with the team. And that's what we what we do. And in fact, there are things that leaders do specifically, leader tasks, as the research has shown, that will help build and then lead resilient teams. And again, it's a resilient team is one that can overcome adversity together and then adapt and grow as a result of that adversity. And what we also found out was there is, an, there is a, obviously, there's adversity in the military profession. There are overseas <laughs> and deployments. Uh, and, but even back at home, long hours and training and constant moves and so forth, what we found out is that there's indeed, there is adversity in every industry. Nobody has an easy time of it all the time. And in fact, the, it, what's ironic is that if you're the type of leader that's trying to build a world-class organization, wherever that may be, in retail or in healthcare and manufacturing, whatever your industry may be, if you're trying to build a world-class organization, oftentimes leaders are the source of much of the adversity in the workplace oh my gosh. Uh, because they're demanding, not demanding, but they want, they're trying to get, they're establishing high standards. They're really improving their processes and their products in the way that they do things. They are fixing things that aren't broke because they think or they know or they hope that they can be better. And this creates adversity. That's a lot of the adversity that's created in the military environment is the training and the military personnel do this constant being to be the best. Mm -hmm. I think the army, the be all you can be, right? This constant striving to be very good at what you do so that you can do it very well when called upon is stressful and and creates adversity that, that must be overcome. Think of the adversity that nurses and doctors went through on the front lines of the COVID crisis, an enormous amount. And, uh, and again, this is, it, it, there's adversity in all types, all types of organizations. What you find is when you build a resilient team, if you weren't already raising standards and trying to do better at what it is that you do, once you build these types of these teams, then you, it allows you to, to do those sort of things. Absolutely. No, that's, you brought up a really good point and in, intrinsic with your program is that it is not geared towards one industry, one type of leader. It's, it reaches across the board because it hits on the research is based on how humans perform and how humans react to the tools that humans can use regardless of the situation. One of the things that I thought of here on Rogan all the time, I think it's an unattributed quote where he says, the most difficult thing that you've been through is the most difficult thing that you've been through. And it's as simple as that. So it doesn't, the comparison is irrelevant. It's more of the acknowledgement that yeah, we are going to deal with adversity. It's think also of the book, I reference this all the time, so I apologize for the people who are regular listeners who hear me tell this story all the time. But Angela Duckworth wrote a book called Grit. Yes. And oh my gosh, what an incredible book. And in the book, she mentioned Michael Phelps and how he did some kind of mental exercises prior to getting into the pool. And one of the exercises was he would envision things going wrong. He would envision adversity. So people always talk about, oh, have the vision. I remember my dad telling me when I was growing up playing football, I was a running back. And he would say, he's like, you got to see the hole. You got to have it in your vision that this hole is going to open up and that's where you're going to go through. And through, it's so common now. It's like envision the good, the whole idea of the secret. Envision the good and the good will come. And, and, to a certain extent, there's I'm, there's some power in visualization practices and things like that. But I think there's also a lot of power on the flip side of that same coin of envisioning those kind of negative events taking place. Like Michael Phelps would envision while he's doing the turn at the end of the pool, his goggle inverting and is and water just dumping into his eye and how he would do i don't know if he ever specifically trained where he's like okay i'm gonna do this without vision he may have but he, if he did it's because he envisioned that adversity coming up and then he trained for it and so you plan for these things i think that, that was relevant but the idea is that stood out to me like i said is the is this cross industry 
platform that you've created that it's not curated to just one type of organization. Yeah. My question for you is with that being said, there are, and you had even mentioned the medical field is rife with adversity and stress and just high op tempo, very similar to the military in that it's like everything that you do matters a lot right now. And so your performance is critical. And part of what I think people miss in resilience, they talk about it's bouncing back from adversity, which it absolutely is, but it's also being able to do that live in real time to be able to continue to perform through the adversity, not just okay, getting knocked down. And grow. Exactly. Adapt and grow as a result. That is the, that's the key component is the adapt and grow. And teams, teams can adversity, adapt and grow. Organizations can overcome adversity, adapt and grow. That's the definition of a resilient organization. It's also the definition of a learning organization. Yes. Learning organizations overcome adversity, adapt and grow. And there, and as you said, this is applicable to what we've done. What we've developed is applicable to all industries. Some industries, the adversity, the stress is, it's obvious. I helped the front lines of the healthcare crisis and so forth. But all industries have adversity from time to time in the workplace. And, and when it happens, it's best, it's best to be prepared for it. Going back to Angela Duckworth, I'll say that I'm a big fan. In fact, I just saw her. She facilitated a discussion in New York City that I attended a few months ago as part of Tech Week, Educational Technology Week in New York City. And of course, she defines uh, grit as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Passion and perseverance. There's a fine line between if you take grit, and the folks may ask me sometimes, when does grit become resilient? So grit as defined by Angela Duckworth, passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Imagine during on that path towards your long-term goals, you run into significant adversity that sort of pushes you back a good bit. And in order to move forward, you overcome and learn some very hard lessons and perhaps change the way you do things in the future. That's when grit, you get from grit to resilience is this, this significant setback potentially and, and learning, adapting, growing, being stronger forward. When, and when you begin to understand that adversity, setbacks, anything that doesn't go well in the workplace is an opportunity for learning and change and growth. It changes your mindset about the tough times in the workplace, the tough times in your organization are opportunities to, to get through it. And then to, at the end of it, to say, what have we learned here? What do we do different? How do we make sure that we're stronger the next time, the next time that happens? Yeah, I love the interplay between grit and resilience and that they're I w I'm studying the psychology of personality right now. And one of the interesting things in that is that there's a bunch of what might be considered competing theories, but the way that personality theorists consider them are more like tools in the kit bag. Right. So you have a plethora of ways to approach problems or ideas from the personality space. And I see that as being very similar between the grit and resilience is that they feed into each other and being more resilient makes you more gritty and being exactly. more gritty makes you more resilient. And, so, and a grit is applicable to all kinds of folks and all kinds of work from all kinds of backgrounds, so as is resilience and as is the idea of building teams. The fact is that leaders, we talk about hard skills, soft skills. Sometimes you say that soft skills are people skills. The fact is that leader in all industries, what they have in common is that they're leading people. And so it doesn't matter whether you're leading people uh, in retail or the military or, or healthcare or manufacturing or what have you, leading people, there are a lot of, there's a lot of common ground in how we, and how we lead teams, how we lead to teams to accomplish goals. I think I literally just wrote this in a newsletter that I put out was that people are people regardless of where you're at. Like you're if you're a human, you're going to be interacting with other people. You're going to have interplay with other people. And that's why that's if you want to just get real simple brass tacks, that's why resilience matters. <laughs> one of the Indeed. one of the components when I was thinking about earlier was that this cross the cross industry component. And when you with the work that you've been doing have you seen any sort of trends with the organizations that are 
willing to lean forward because taking on a resilience training program for your organization requires a forward thinking or i guess it could be we've dealt with a lot of adversity and we've had a lot of problems and right. we need to figure out a way to get over it so it could yeah. it could be backwards as well but have you seen any particular industries being more prone and open to this idea and a follow-up you could just add into this is what what are the kind of testimonials? What are the reviews? What are people saying once they go through this training, they get certified and they enter their organizations? What differences are we seeing? What are the tactics? Like I said at the beginning on the onset, I want to get real tactical because I know that you have it. I know that it's there. So what are we seeing actually happen? So we we market, we are a business, a business to consumer organization. To give you some background here, we once we determined the framework, put it together, we developed two things at that point. Our goal was to develop a certification exam. We wanted to develop a tool that would assess understanding of these concepts. Competency. So similar to other certifications that your audience might be familiar with, a project management certification or an HR certification or any number of technical certifications, we wanted to be able to assess it. That's what we thought was missing in the marketplace. There was lots of training available from different sources, but there wasn't a standardized assessment that employers could rely on to know that the person, that person in the organization had passed an exam on that particular that topic in the same way that they could with project management or HR or any other number of the topics. And so we from that from that research, competency the leader task, competency domains mapped to three levels. We developed three separate certification exams to assess that knowledge. One for frontline supervisors, one for middle managers, and one for senior leaders. And what middle managers need to know is everything that frontline supervisors know and a little bit more. And then the same with the, the senior leader. So we had facilitate team learning at the middle management level and then support organizational learning for the senior leader level. And the first three competency domains of create a positive climate, develop cohesion, and provide purpose are common, common to all. So we developed the exams. That was quite a process. If we tried to develop written exam. What we found out was that it was simply impossible. It was a fool's errand to try to develop an exam written that would assess leader competencies with true, false, multiple choice. No way to do it. It would require essay type questions and essay type responses. And then with that, you weren't able to get after the context. And so we determined that the only way to do this was through oral exam. And that's a discriminator between what we've done and what many other certifications do. We've basically disrupted that space a bit by developing and deploying a, an oral exam in the space. And then, so we have the exams that we developed. That was the core part of the program. But we wanted to also develop a training program that would get folks ready to sit for the exam, to, that would help them understand their years of leader follower experience and put that in context of this framework and then prepare them to sit for the exam. And we did that. So we developed both and we actually provided the training ourselves for about a year and a half or two years. And then we eventually spun off that part of the business and now we partner with colleges and universities. We partner with leadership coaches and training companies. We're partnered with universities like Pepperdine University, Georgia Southern University, the University of Texas at San Antonio, and many others. And we're aggressively partnering with more and more universities to scale the program nationwide. Our partners provide the training that, that gets folks ready to sit for the exam if they want to. Not all do. Some only want to get the training and take it and apply it in the workplace. Others are interested in actually sitting for the exam, very similar to project management or, or human resource management. That training and the exam is we is marketed to individuals. It's an individual decision to take this training and sit for the exam to make yourself a better leader in the workplace. And typically this is, it's mostly individuals that have pretty good educational benefits available either from their work or from the military, or they were veterans, for example, the military has very good educational benefits and they pay for the training and certification. The GI Bill is a very good education benefit that service members use after they leave the service, and that pays for the training and the certification. And, and most big corporations have the benefits that will pay for this type. 
So with regard to types of organizations, it's not that organi- organizations are embracing, it's that right. individuals within the organization are wanting to get trained so they can do a better job. We have done we have done a lot of work, certified a lot of military personnel and veterans. And I think there's probably for two reasons. One, they inherently understood or bought into the idea of building resilient teams because they may have been doing that for years anyway, but it's also a product of the, that they have very good education benefits in the military and the military promotes off-duty education quite, quite aggressively. We are hoping that as we continue to partner with universities, colleges across the country that will, that will see certified people in lots and lots of interest. In fact, of the military people we certified, most of those have now transitioned and have landed in different types of industries across the country. As they tell people about the training and certification, we see those people coming to get get certified. So that's really great. Have any of them? Do you stay in contact? I guess because it's not you're not the one who's actually providing the training. It's your yeah, partners. We, we 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 stay. So they provide the training, then we provide the exam. For those that take the exam, we do stay in touch because there's a recertification requirement at the three year mark. And so we've been doing this long enough now that we have certification holders that are recertifying. And as part of that process, they they do a professional development exercise where they write out in narrative form how they've been applying those specific Mm. leader tasks in the workplace. This is a great source of data information for us because we can tell what people have been doing since they were certified. And we're getting we're getting a tremendous amount of, of really good feedback on that. I've interviewed personally some of the people that are recertifying. Uh, to ask them about how they're how they're using these leader tasks is the framework been valuable to them and without fail it's all been good feedback and indeed I've asked I asked the question has did having this certification help you get your current job did you get a promotion did you get a job did you get were you assigned a special project to lead because you had this certification and the answer has been yes but not in the way you might imagine. It wasn't because I had the certification on my resume and that somebody recognized that and said, oh, I know exactly what that is. And so I want to give you this job. But what it did is that knowledge and the fact that they took an oral exam where they were required to articulate how these concepts are applicable in the workplace, they interviewed that more confident about talking about these tasks in the workplace. And because of that, uh, they were given a promotion or special assignment or it helped them get them get the job that that they're in now. And that is a benefit that we did not foresee. But as you can imagine, we're quite happy. (laughs) We're quite happy to, to hear about. That's it brings me back to uh, the conversation we were having the other day about chat BT chat GPT. There's all of this talk now about universities and professors coming out with and having voicing their concerns about students and them not writing their papers and then passing exams based on not their work but the work of an ai machine and one of the things that they've been floating as a potential solution is having people write out by hand their exams which with some of these papers we're talking about like 10 15 20 35 page papers you're gonna hand write that this is not the 1700s people so let's be realistic but one of the things that they were talking about is exactly what you guys already started doing before any of this came out which is oral examinations and there's this is something that I, i teach my kids it's something that i teach the organizations that i work with it's everybody that will listen i always tell this to and i even tell it to myself on a routine basis that when i'm picking up a new piece of information I If I cannot train somebody on that piece of information, then I don't know it. If I can't explain it back to you at a 8th, 5th, 3rd grade level, then I really don't understand it. Then I'm just regurgitating some of the keywords and jargon that I read in a textbook. But if I can't give it in my own words with my own ideas and my own experience and tie that in... It's not really learning. It's just rote memorization. And right. that, when I found that out about your guys' organization, I was just over the moon enthusiastic about this because that, is, and it's not even, I, I love that this is so far beyond the idea 
of doing an oral examination, but it's you've actually done it. People have actually gone through and tested out and you've gotten the feedback that this is providing a real, if they're able to communicate this in an interview type situation, like maybe you don't. We've know, done thousands, they're using of exams over the, thousands of exams over the past three years. And back to the research and development phase so back in 2018, 2019, as we were testing this, testing the training, testing the, testing the exam. So I said, we thought about a, an oral written exam at first, determined that, that just wasn't possible. And once we started doing the oral exams, we really started seeing the benefit of this and how powerful it was going to be. In fact, so much so that we decided to call our middle manager certification, Resilience Building Leadership Professional Coach. So RBLP, C for coach. And at the senior leader level, we called that one trainer. Not because we're trying to prepare those individuals to be professional coaches in the marketplace or professional trainers, but because coaching and training is part of your job as a leader in an organization. If you're a middle manager, you have a responsibility to coach your frontline supervisors to help them be better at what they do, particularly help them build resilient teams. And so what we determined as we were doing these oral exams in the R&D phase was that because they're passing an oral exam, we can be confident, we can advertise to the organizations that are using their, providing education benefits for these people to take these exams, that per, you can be confident that the person that has earned this certification is going to be able to articulate those concepts in the workplace. And they will be able to coach their, their frontline supervisors and the, sen uh, the senior leaders, the RBLPTs for trainer, would be able to train others in the workplace to do the same thing. And so the oral exam, I think, is really our, has really been a, a benefit to us. It's a strategic a competitive advantage, we believe. It's probably why there wasn't a leadership certification in the marketplace that gained any type of momentum or any credibility prior prior to ours. There are plenty of leadership training programs or certificate mm -hmm. programs where at the end of the training, you receive a certificate saying you've completed it. And indeed, that's what our customers get when they finish their training program at a university. But there wasn't a certification program, a standardized exam given to thousands of people done the same way over and over that attested to comprehension of that knowledge. That did not exist prior to what we developed. So we are, we're, so we're leading, definitely leading in this field. That's, I think that's crucial that there's, there isn't really a lot or much of any competition <laughs> For yeah. you guys and what you're doing. That's yeah, in fact, you talk it, about disrupting spaces. Yeah, we have. And there's a lot of room for growth in what we're doing. In fact, we've caught the attention of some investors. We recently sold some stock in our company through an equity crowdfunding and, and sold basically 10% of the company for a million dollars to a number to well over a hundred people. So we have a lot of we have a lot of people that see the potential in what we're doing. And our vision at RBLP is to create a worldwide community community of practice committed to building and leading resilient teams. We want that phrase, building and leading resilient teams, and those concepts, those 29 leader tasks and five competency domains mapped to three levels of uh, leadership in an organization. We want that to become as ubiquitous as project management or human resource management is today. Uh, the Project Management Institute decades ago, when they, when they decide, when they determined that project management was something separate and distinct from operations management had to convince people of that. It had to, people had to buy into that idea. They had to see it for themselves. And some people back then said, listen, management is management. There's no projects, operations, it's all the same thing. And what they were saying is no, project management is different. There are specific competencies, specific tasks that you do to lead, to manage a project that are different from managing continuous operation. Uh, projects have a specific start date, a specific end date. There are phases to a project that include a closing phase where the project wraps up and specific competence, specific things to learn. 
And it took a while for that to catch on. But now the term project management is a term that is used every day in organizations of all kinds all over the world. And that's where we're headed, a worldwide community of practice committed to building and leading resilient teams. Not everyone in that worldwide community of practice will want to sit for one of our certification exams, just like all project managers don't sit for the project management exam. But some of them, some of them will. So our real business, our real goal is the dissemination of the knowledge. In fact, with our partners, college and university partners, training companies, we reiterate to them that the most important thing is helping them uh, provide the training to as many people as they can. And those that want to sit for an exam, we're ready when they want to. But the more important thing is to get the knowledge out. Yeah, I think that's crucial. It's it's evident and you continue to bring up that not everyone's going to take the exam and that's okay. And it's a testament to your belief or dare I say knowledge that the propagation of this is is going to be inherently intrinsically beneficial to individuals, to teams, and to organizations. I think it all goes back to what you were talking about with the learning organizations. So if you have an organiz- organization who prides itself on being a learning organization and you have, you have L&D department heads now, or at least managers. And I also love the, the analogy or the correlation to the project management side of things, because man, has that taken off like wildfire, like PMP right. and all that's everywhere. You see on LinkedIn profiles, you see it on right. resumes, like that is huge. And so this can be equally as huge, especially when it HR- is. Our certification is complimentary to the project matter. If you go to link LinkedIn and type in RBLP as a search term, and then click on the people tab, it will return 1000 results today. A thousand people that have RBLP somewhere in their profile. And if you take a look through those, you'll notice that quite a few of them have both PMP and RBLP. You'll notice that quite a few of them have advanced degrees. We've certified dozens and dozens of folks with terminal degrees like myself. So you'll see PhD, comma, RBLPT. So it's an excellent compliment to what the Project Management Institute is doing. They're focused on the teaching management skills of projects. The human resource certifications are teaching human resource management skills. What we're teaching and certifying folks on what our program does are the leadership skills that complement those management skills. Those the PMP is a kind of a hard skill, big to the management of projects. I would say human resources, hard skills, very specific. What we're doing is a general, and it recognizes that people are the are the same in all types of organizations. How they how they should be led. You mentioned change management is is a hot topic, and most change management practitioners or professionals will begin by telling you that change is hard, and that uh, lots of change initiatives fail. And I I completely agree with that. And what you're describing is adversity that must be overcome. Change is hard, which means it creates adversity, which means it must be overcome and you adapt and grow as a result of it. And the adapt and grow indeed is the change that the folks are looking for. So uh, I think change management is about is about is about overcoming adversity and adapt and grow as a result. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious. I have a potential guys that I want to do with you. Okay. Should you be interested? Okay. <laughs> so could you walk us through how you and the leaders in your organization have used the five competencies in the development and in the ongoing running of your organization? So we get like a real tacticals or yeah, tangible absolutely. sense of what's going on. I'll tell you what, I'll focus in on one of our one leader task and the middle manager it's introduced and assessed at the, what's assessed at the middle manager level is a task we call analyze team learning capacity. And when you go through the training program, you realize you understand and actually you you know this from your from your work experience and it and what the training program does is bring it to light is that teams learn the same way that people learn. We learn from our experience. And there was a an academic, his name is David Kolb. He and his wife, Alice, have done an enormous amount of research on the idea of ex- experiential learning or how people learn from their experience. They've founded an institute. It's all very popular. They created what's called the experiential learning cycle. 
It starts with experience at the top, say 12 o'clock on this cycle. 12 o'clock is the experience. And an experience can be a week of work, an event that you just did. It could be the a fire department's response to a burning building is an experience. There are all types of experiences in, in work. In sports, if it's a football game, the first half of the game is an experience that you can learn from to do better in the second half of the game. A week of work is an experience that you can learn from to do better the following week of work. So that at 12 o'clock is experience. At three o'clock is reflection on the experiential learning cycle. Reflection is what we do to learn, to begin the learning process from our experience. So we can imagine the football team in the locker room at halftime, they are reflecting on the first half of the game collectively as a team with leaders in place that are guiding that reflection. If you get together at the end of a week of work and talk about how it went, you're able to reflect on that. You're able to reflect on an event that you may have supported. Reflection is at three o'clock and that's where you're the main question there is, what we do, how could we do, we reflect because we want to do it better. We want to improve. We want to innovate. There may be a problem that needs to be solved, a challenge that needs to be overcome. A problem is an experience that you can reflect on. Down at six o'clock is the thinking and concluding and decision part of the learning cycle. So at six o'clock is where we make decisions based on that reflection, decisions to change. Let's do this differently. Let's change this. Let's try something here down at six o'clock. And then at nine o'clock on the experiential learning cycle is where we take action. So the decisions that you made at six o'clock, the planning, you put that into action and that brings you back up to 12 o'clock for a new experience. The idea is that if you reflect on something and then you make some decisions to change and you actually put those decisions into action that you'll get a new experience. I think it was Steiner, somebody said that doing the same thing over and expecting a different result is insanity. Uh, exactly. If you go around the learning cycle and you don't reflect and you don't make decisions to put something different into action, indeed you will end up, you will end up with the same results. So that leader task that we evaluate, assess at the middle manager level falls right in the center of our training program. And it does because it pulls together the things that you learn from, from create a positive climate, develop cohesion and provide purpose that lays the foundation for a team to get around this learning cycle, which is very difficult. In fact, when leaders are forcing their teams through that learning cycle, just the act of going through the learning cycle creates adversity. This is not, It's not easy to get a team together and have a good constructive dialogue about how to improve what they're doing. That's difficult. Making decisions sometimes to change, to improve decisions that may not be received well is a difficult thing to do and creates adversity. And then putting new plans into action where people must change their mental models about how we do things around here is difficult and creates adversity. So you build resilient teams so that you can make the changes that you need to make. And so for us in a startup, in a new organization like the Experiential Learning Cycle, Learning from our experience, learning from our mistakes, learning from our successes is an ongoing process that we're very conscious of. When we meet, when I meet with my team to talk about, to reflect on our experience, to reflect on what we're doing, how we're marketing, how we're working with our partners, how we're administering exams. When we reflect for the express purpose of making a decision to improve or to innovate or to solve a problem or to overcome a challenge. There's no need to meet and talk and discuss unless you intend to make a decision. We've all been in meetings where we came out of the meeting and we thought to ourselves, that's 90 minutes of my life I'll never get back. And that was a waste of time because all we did was talk and nobody made a decision. So we meet with the express intent of making a decision. And then when we make the decision, this is when people say they've slapped the table. They're at six o'clock on the experiential learning cycle. We've slapped the table and we've made a decision. The next step, of course, is to put that into action. We don't make decisions here in our organization without immediately following up with who's got the next action. How do we put this? How do we take action on this? 
And a lot of times you have to take action. You have to be willing to fail. Listen, if you get around the experiential learning cycle, if you make a decision and try something, put it into action and it doesn't work out, has the learning occurred? Absolutely. Now you know it doesn't work. And there's probably something there that did work that you can get after. So it's about getting around and around the experiential learning cycle as fast as you can, effectively and efficiently, though, because the teams that can get around that the most often with the most success win. Imagine how many times Thomas Edison went around that cycle before he ended up with a light bulb. Reflection, make decisions to change, put that into action, get a new experience. Football teams go through that in real time for a solid three hours. Coaches on the side, every time you call a timeout, they come over, they reflect, they make decisions, go back out on the field, put those decisions into action. It happens in real time when a quarterback calls an audible at the line of scrimmage, and it happens in every single workplace. People that are listening to this podcast today are going to be able to think about what they're doing in the workplace And they're going to be able to determine where they're at on the experiential learning cycle in regards to any particular problem or improvement that they've been talking about for some time. So is it that we're, are we never getting to the three o'clock reflection because not everybody agrees there's a problem? Are we getting to the three o'clock reflection, but not making a decision for whatever reason? Are we making decisions at six o'clock, but not putting them into action for any number of reasons? And are we putting them into action, but then once it either works or doesn't work, are we not adopting that into our practices? Sometimes we do things that work and for whatever reason, we don't codify it into practice because higher headquarters doesn't condone it or won't approve it. So there, you can fall off of the experiential learning cycle at any point. So for us, living what we teach and what we write on our exams, uh, we do every day. And uh, that experiential learning cycle is, uh, is a very good example of that. There, there are many others, but that's, uh, that's one of my favorites. And in fact, I'm going to be teaching a deep dive course on that on the Maven, in the Maven, on the Maven website or portal, it's, which is similar to Masterclass, but instead of recorded lessons, it's live interactive lessons with a subject matter expert. And I'll be teaching that it doesn't specifically prepare folks for our exam because it's a deep dive into one specific leader test, but for anybody that's already been certified or any of the dozens and dozens of people out there at colleges and companies that are teaching this program, it's it's going to be of interest to them. And for people that have not been certified yet that are just interested in getting a little taste of what it's all about, they may be interested in that as well. But that's certainly my favorite leader task is this analyze, analyze team learning capacity Because what we're asking people to do is figure out where you're at on that learning cycle and why you're not getting through it fast enough. And of course, the obvious after that is to get better. What's the, if people wanted to attend, how do they do that? Attend the, one of the courses that prepares people for our exam? No, the, uh, the talk that you're about to give, the deep dive you're about to give on Maven. Maven, yeah, we're, it's still, we're developing that now. I think we're building the landing page and some other things in conjunction with the Maven folks, but eventually they'll be able to go to maven.com and look up that course. They could search by me, by my name. If they search Dr. Gene Coughlin, they'll find it. Or if they search some other keywords, probably experiential learning, or I think, actually, I think what we might call this is bias for action your teams you may make it your team's superpower something to that effect because the you've heard that term bias for action before thinking back to that cycle i just described bias for action means you can get from the six o'clock decision to the nine o'clock action we leaders that have a bias for action are celebrated there it's a it's, it's a good thing to be described as a person as a leader in the workplace that has a bias for action they mean by that is that this is the person that can make sure a team gets to a decision and then implements that decision in a time in a timely manner. Without decisions and without taking action on them, we're stuck. No learning, no learning occurs. In fact, if people and teams that that fail to get through the learning cycle, we say things like, oh my gosh, they'll never learn. That poor, those poor folks will just never learn. And you don't, that's not how you want somebody to describe you or your team. I think that brings up that actually naturally segues into the component of this that I wanted to bring up. And we had talked about this before, but it's this idea. So this system, the experiential learning cycle, really 
I guess subtly or not necessarily completely overtly highlights the requisite failures that come with decision making and they yeah. make it a part of the process. And I think what's important for leaders who are listening to this today that have already, once you mentioned this, they're already, just as you said, putting their current task list and their management through this in their head. Oh, on this project, we're at a three with this project, we're at a nine. And so they're already doing this. I think it's crucial. One, one, I can't imagine somebody hearing this process, this cycle and ever hosting a meeting again that isn't based on this process because it's so gosh darn effective and it turn it one it reduces the times of meetings it makes them way more tangible and productive it gets people out there back working on the task with specific levels of accountability but one of what back to the idea of failure like i had mentioned to you before is we've built educational systems around the idea that we shun we shame and we have disdain for failure and the kid yeah, feels it shame. i know it's crazy because you think on the surface like yeah we don't want people to fail we want people to succeed yes of course <laughs> but the path to success is riddled with failure and if you're teaching people that you teach them for a test and then it's the written true false non-oral examination and they you've taught them for the test then they test and they pass and you do this hundreds of thousands of times through their educational career and they're like okay i get the information i regurgitate the information and i pass and i do this over and i like how many tests do people fail or how many quizzes how many assignments do they fail those who make it through school way less than the ones that they pass right, right. just by the nature of passing so you are building up a lack of tolerance and intolerance for failure with a bias towards success and a bias towards success is good but i think a bias towards success pales in comparison to the bias for action like you were talking Dude. about so how i don't know what are you what are your thoughts on the on that aspect of education and how do we overcome that how does the resilience can the people who go through this training how do they implement this maybe even in their families yeah they, we need to we're trying to get folks to understand and even celebrate, celebrate failure, celebrate setbacks as an opportunity to learn. As th It's adverse. Failure is an adversity. Again, our building resilient teams. Resilient teams can overcome adversity and then adapt and grow together as a result of that adversity. As people mature in this program, as they initially get certified and uh, begin to understand the concept, and then take these concepts into the workplace, they gain a deeper appreciation because they understand that the experiential learning cycle, this idea of making decisions and taking action for improvement, for innovation, solve problems, actually creates adversity because you begin to drive failure. You begin to adopt an attitude that says, let's just try this. Or, and regardless of whether it fails and it's not about it's not about taking risks that are inappropriate or dangerous it's about understanding the risk that you're taking and saying to yourself what's the worst case scenario here we one of the leader tasks in the early part of the program is manage expectations and what we talk about there is that we need to manage the expectations of our teams that sometimes things go sideways and that we will fail more often than we will succeed. We will try things that aren't going to work, and that's okay. But we always ask ourselves, what's the worst case scenario here? Is, this, is it going to be the end of the company, the end of the team, if we don't get this right? And usually what you find out is that, no, it's not going to be the end of the team. It's not going to be the end of the company. It's not going to be the end of the world. So let's get a bit more aggressive, a bit let's adopt a mindset of risk taking, if you will. Let's try things to see what works and let's let our learning be incremental. Let's learn a let's try something and learn from it. 
and then get around the cycle. And we say, go back to the drawing board. The drawing board's at three o'clock on that cycle that I just talked to you about. <laughs> you have an experience at 12 o'clock and it didn't work. And someone says, let's go back to the drawing board. The drawing board's at three o'clock. Let's talk about it. Let's reflect on what happened. Let's discuss it. Problem frame. What really happened? Get the right people in the room. We have a leader task called Encourage Constructive Dialogue, which helps facilitate this process. And then you make a decision and you put that into action. So we're teaching people, as people learn these and then take them into the workplace, they begin to realize that, that risk failure isn't need not be a bad word. The zero defect mentality is not appropriate for an organization that's trying to do great things. It's And this cycle is how we go from an iPhone 10 to an iPhone 12. The user experience of the iPhone 10 is the experience. Then engineers at Apple reflect on that user experience and how could we make it better? What are our customers saying? And what do we think the art of the possible is here? And they have a lot of good constructive dialogue about how to make improvements and then they make decisions on how to do that and plans to support those decisions. And then they put those in to action and they may test those things several times before they actually launch that product. So to go from an iPhone 10 to an iPhone 12, engineers at Apple probably went around that experiential learning cycle thousands of times of times until the experience that they finally got to was the ready to go product that they called an iPhone 12 and they deploy it. Now, of course, the cycle continues well after deployment. And that's why your phone updates so often because they because the cycle doesn't stop. They continue to assess experience, reflect on that, make decisions, put those decisions into action. And every time you get an update as a result of that process, uh, we want people to understand that, that, that failure, taking chances, seeing what works, is not is not a bad thing. It takes a little bit of courage to do that. And in in our organization, we all I have I can't tell you the number of ideas I've had since I made and put into action that just didn't work. And at the end of it, I just say, listen, that was that was my idea and it didn't work. That was a retrospect. That wasn't a good idea at all. But because if I, we say if I only if I knew then what I know now. What you know now is the result of experiential learning. It's the result, it's the product of your experience because you've been around that cycle a few times. Well, know what you know now without forcing this cycle, forcing the learning. And so we embrace what doesn't work. We laugh about it and we move on. We take whatever we can learn from it. We go back to the drawing board at three o'clock and we make decisions as soon as we can, and we put those into action, and we see what happens. We just keep doing that. It's the cycle. It's the cycle that that's important. It's it's like training for a marathon. It's the training that's important. So we just keep pushing through the cycle, knowing that eventually we're going to get to what we want. I think that's oh, it's so. It's like you're always speaking on the thing that I'm going to comment on next it's such a beautiful flow i the last bit that i wanted to do just to wrap up on the on this particular point is that it is all about the process it's all in this case the cycle right it's all about the system the cycle the process and when you incorporate failure acknowledging failure as a part of the process and that then that sets the expectation that that we can fail that failure is a part of it it's simply a step and that's why we have three o'clock that's why we have reflection so we can look at it we can look at what we did and see what worked and i think you also it's one thing to say that and it's one thing to say yeah you can fail but then the natural tendency in the workplace is then to say is to always go towards a oh, success. We got to get what works. We got to get what works. And we, and you get that fear of trying something new and different. And the way you illustrated this perfectly with how you explained your, uh, the failures that you guys experience in your organization and that you laugh about it. You joke, you take, you don't take yourself too seriously to where you can't have that open and effective dialogue like you were talking about. That's one of, I have the six principles of connected leadership to bring people together within an organization to build robust and resilient cultures, right? We're very right. much on the same page. And effective communication is like number one. That's you. Ha if you can't effectively communicate and that goes beyond 
the let's sit down and do your performance review. Okay, hey, here's the tasks that need to be completed. It's it goes beyond that. It's like I end up focusing on between the lines. Like what are the communications happening between those events? Well, that's you know? an accelerant to this process that uh, is worthy of uh, many a deep dive. And so <laughs> our program is a brilliance at the basics program for many people that do go through our training, our building and leading resilient teams training at a at, with one of our education or training partners. That may be their introduction to these concepts. And then our certification exam assesses, evaluates that they have a solid understanding of the basics of how this cycle works. Now, getting really good at that is going to take time. It's going to take experience. And so there's a, there are many deep dives into how to get through this more efficiently and more effectively. And we, we're looking forward to the day when lots of other training companies are do, is similar to what I'm going to be doing on the Maven website there, that taking a deep dive into this. But it could be, there could be more deep dives into this. There's so much. By their, yeah, certification exams by their very definition, their nature are about ensuring a certain level of competence. And that's when somebody has, and when someone passes the bar exam, for example, the general public and the law firms and courts know attorney proven by passing the bar exam that they have a baseline understanding of the law and its application. But after you pass the bar and you start practicing law, the real learning begins and you begin to specialize it and law in a certain area. So for us, building and leading resilient teams in the manufacturing sector or the healthcare sector will have some unique differences. The baseline is the same because it's people, but once you get certified, then you take that into your own practice and you get better and better at, at what you do. You learn the nuance, just like different types of different types of law I have nuance, but you must build a baseline first. That's what law school does. That's what our building and leading resilient teams course at colleges and universities does. Then once you graduate law school, you sit for the bar exam so you can prove to the public and the future employers that you understand the basics, you paid attention in law school and you can apply it and pass an exam. That's what we do. Come to us, take the exam. But then once you get out there, you really begin to, that's just the beginning of your journey. Getting certified is not the end. Getting certified is the beginning because now we want you to go forth and do great things with this knowledge. We want you to, we want you to analyze your team's learning capacity. We want you to encourage constructive dialogue so you can get through there. We want you to build new mental models as a result of getting through there. We want you to orient on team goals and set ever increasing higher goals for your team because they're you're confident in their building this uh, collective efficacy that they can get through this learning cycle and they can do they can do great things together. Anytime in the workplace where someone says, "Ooh, we're going to have to figure this out." initiates the learning cycle. If you set a goal for a team and someone on the team looks at it and says, ooh, boss, that's going to be tough. I see some problems there. That initiates the learning cycle because you have to figure out how you're going to reach reach that goal. And that the real that getting certified gives you the foundation that you can start applying these in real time out in, in the workforce. And what we're hearing from the certification holders that are recertifying at this point is that it's been very helpful for them to learn this framework, to learn these concepts, and to actually start applying those consciously in the workforce, that it's been beneficial and that they've been, they're doing better at what they do and their employers are recognizing. That's what we want. We want we, we're a business Our organization is consumer oriented. We want, we're talking to each individual person and saying that we, you should do this because you're going to do a better job in your organization. Eventually, years down the road, there will certainly be organizations once they have lots of certified people on the rolls, they may begin to say, gosh, where we have so many of these now, we are really starting to see the difference between this group of 50 or 100 or 300 that did this program and earned this certification and the work that they're doing and the success that they're having versus these 300 that may not. That'll take some time and we're looking forward to, we, I think I can see into the future and know what's, know, know that is going to happen. You've proven that you've been able to see into the future in the past by overcoming <laughs> chat GBT before it's even twinkle in the eye of the creators. But the 
One of the things that you just mentioned and that you reiterated time and time again is that this is a focus of like the brilliance at the basics is what you said. And good grief, I love that term. So living in a hyper niched, hyper non-nuanced, that wouldn't be the right word, <laughs> opposite of that, but hyper specialized world where everyone needs to be the absolute utmost epitome expert in what they do. And if you're not doing that, then you're not going to succeed and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and that's the reason that we're seeing decreased numbers in not general practitioners, but the in, in doctors like your like the your primary care physician. We're right. seeing a decrease in those because it's generalized medicine. It's not that specific. I work on this part right. of your body and that's where the money is. And so people are flocking towards the money. And your, I love your fearless, not even acknowledgement, but fearless embrace of focusing on the basics. And I'll tell you why. So I was stationed at Fort Bragg for five and a half years. In, in there, I did a lot of knuckle dragging in the beginning. I was a stinger missile guy, right? And so digging foxholes, jumping out of airplanes, going forward with sniper teams and stuff like that to go set up our positions. That was a lot of fun. I realized there wasn't a ton of future in that. So I shifted to intelligence, ended up going to the 82nd Airborne and was an intel guy over there. That during both of those experiences there, I had interactions. I'm not one of these guys. Admittedly, I'm not that cool, but I had many interactions with folks that were in the special operations community. And for the army, that was typically Rangers and special forces. I was on Fort Bragg. It's kind of like the home of special forces. That's where they do a lot of the training. And so I had a lot of interaction with Green Berets. And I would ask them, I was like, what, what makes you guys so good? And not even in a demeaning way, but it was almost like, how are you guys so proficient, so much more proficient at doing these things? And I had a mis misinterpretation of what they did as being different than what other folks in the army do. They, they perform differently. And yes, they have a different mission, but at the end of the day, pulling a trigger is pulling a trigger controlling your weapons, controlling your weapon. And they told me, like, it's not that we do anything. It's not that what we do is different. It's our level of mastery of the absolute basics. So the most elite soldiers in the army are saying that we don't get different training. They do in some regards, of course, but they just do it instead of, Hey, we're going to go to the range because we need to qualify once every six months. So we pull out our weapons on that sixth month and then we go to the range and we zero shoot. Oh, no, we're shooting thousands of rounds a day in that portion of the training. Like we're the magazine transition from empty mag to new mag happens hundreds of times in a single day training cycle. And so that simple action of dropping a mag and putting a new one in and loading it and continuing to fire while maintaining proper target acquisition, like they that's what they're doing. It's those minute, small, it's the minutia, it's the details that in they're every really mastering. Across America, people have heard the term getting back to basics. Every industry, somebody in the workplace, you, if you think you've heard the term, we need to, somebody has said we need to get back to basics. And so that's the that's the market that we focus on in the certification business, even with ours, building and leading resilient teams and the RBLP series of leadership certifications are about ensuring that people are good at the basics. And then from those basics, they can build. But returning to the basics is something that even those that are in the scenario, you just put the special forces folks who have an advanced set of skills, spend a lot of time returning to the basics uh, in every industry, the basics that you learn in law, the basics that you learn in medicine, the basics that you learn in retail, the basics you learn in the military can't be lost. You have to continually get back to the basics. John Wooden, the, the legendary UCLA basketball coach, developed a what he called the pyramid of success. I encourage your listeners to Google that and take a look at it. And that was his, the basics, according to John Wooden. I have that hanging on a wall. And and John Wooden, when he coached his teams, he started off with, you, you, you can read stories about this, how to put on your socks and how to lace up your shoes. 
And players who had been stars in high school thought that was crazy. That, but he was trying to impress upon them that you have to do the basics and that a ruthless pursuit of mastering, becoming brilliant at the basics, provides the foundation to build a winning team, a winning organization. Now, this pursuit of the basics and then the learning that you can do after you've established that foundation is not easy. I went to, I have two daughters at UCLA, both at UCLA right now, and I was at a basketball game where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the great UCLA player who, who went on to play for many years with the Lakers, was the guest, and he was talking about his remembrance of Coach Wooden, and all of the players all seemed to refer to him as being, being hard, hard on them, and for that, they love him. And so one of the things that leaders eventually learn is that they are, why do we build resilient teams? Because there's adversity and all types of work and leaders, have, they begin to realize that they indeed are the source of a lot of the adversity that their team is enduring. In my organization, I know that I'm the source of most adversity, of the most of it, because I'm setting high standards and I'm I'm changing I have new ideas and things that I want to implement and the speed at which I want to do it. And this is not unique to me. This is unique to anyone that's trying to do great things in an organization in whatever field. You find out that you become the source of a lot of the adversity. And so you should build teams that can overcome the adversity that you're creating and then adapt and grow as a result. And John Wooden as a coach was that. I, I know that some of his players have said that they looked forward to games against other schools because that was a break from practice, that practice was the hard thing. Playing up to the standards that he was setting was the hard thing. The easy thing was to go play another school and win, as they usually did in his many championships while at UCLA, <laughs> or a testament to all of that hard work. So you eventually realize, as you look in the mirror, you say, gosh, I realize that I'm actually the source of a great deal of this adversity because I'm trying to, I'm trying to set high standards and do great things. And I'm insisting that folks try to be brilliant at the basics. And we, I have this mentality of that training is continuous, that every day, there are teachable moments and that we can get better at what we do. And yeah, the br brilliance of the bit, which is not a term that I coined, by the way, that's a term's been used in a lot of places before. Not my term, but I certainly, I certainly believe, I certainly believe in that. And it's why I chose to even get into this certification business to start with, because certification exams by their very nature, just like the bar exam does, proves a test that a person is good at, they've got the basics. They've got the basics down and they're ready to move on to the next, they're ready to move on to the next level. That's great. You did it again. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you led right into the next thing that I wanted to bring up, which is the idea of unnecessary adversity, unnecessary stress to the system, which is hard to gauge, which is why we talked about like the whole, the cycle, the experiential learning cycle matters because then you're able to identify those things. But- <clears throat> There was a study that I read that stuck with me. It was conducted in 2020, 21, published officially in 2022. And it was about, it actually went, it looked backwards, but also pulled in new, more recent studies. And it looked in sales organizations and it looked at the sales representatives. It looked at their, I think it looked primarily at their performance. They may have looked at their retention, which is always what piques my interest because that's where I put that's why I created Connected Leadership to help organizations retain and increase the performance of their employees. But what they found was that when the cohort of sales reps was not connected to their frontline supervisor, that the performance was there was a direct correlation between or a negative correlation between those things as the relationship not even the relationship, but it's the sense of connection. And so it doesn't even have, you don't have to be friends. You have, to, but you have to be connected in, right. in, in some way, whether it be personal values, background, and some of those things aren't, some of those characteristics as listed aren't possible. You know, I'm, I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. That does not align with a lot of people. So, so that's not going to be a point of alignment, but I was in the military. And so that does create alignment with other people. I'm a, I'm even a guy. And so that creates some sort of alignment with guys, but then there's mentality and things like that. So I just, 
I thought that the idea what what are some pitfalls or some examples that you have either experienced yourself or you've seen of leaders in injecting unnecessary adversities into the system by the nature of their i guess maybe even just their personality and creating this propensity for a decreased performance as we saw in this study yeah there's we hear a lot this term toxic leadership unfortunately we're hearing a lot about nowadays so there are apparently lots of toxic leaders out there i haven't spent a lot of time myself look at, at that topic. I've always taken, I'm a sort of positive psychology guy, along Martin, Dr. Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania is the grandfather of the father, grandfather, this uh, movement. I, I prefer to look at what's working, strengths-based approach. So I just have not spent a lot of time looking at the things that, things that don't work. Instead, I look at the things that do work and figure out how do we do more of that. That said, I still, from time to time, obviously, because I've been in the world of work for some time now. I've seen things that don't work and things that I think are ridiculous and things that I hear propagated. I'll give you an example. Here at RBLP, we have a we have an RBLP app that's available in the Apple store and the Google store for download and install on your mobile device. And it's a professional development continuing education tool. We we drop one podcast every hour, 13 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh don't worry, we have a scheduling tool. I'm not making somebody asking somebody to work seven days a week. But what we do is we have folks on our team that are constantly scouring. That's how we found your podcast. We take a look at all of the podcasts that are out there that are popular, that are talking about the things that we think our community of practice would be interested in. And then once we find those, we look through all of their past episodes and then each episode as it comes out and we we curate those and we selectively feed them into our app. So the app gives you an opportunity to scroll through it and see what you like and a lot of different perspectives and you can listen to the podcast right inside of our app. And so it's podcasts and also some YouTube videos we put on there. There was one on a few weeks ago, some YouTube channel who I won't name. The host was giving advice to new frontline supervisors. And part of the advice was that you can't, don't be friends with your team. You can't be their friend and their, at the, and their supervisor at the same time. And it, I think that's ridiculous. We have a leader task called show genuine concern for the people that work for you. And for one thing, that idea, it also it would preclude the promotion from within in any organization. If you have five cashiers at your retail store and your head cashier moves, and so now you need to pick a new head cashier and you want to promote from within as you should, and the cashiers are all friends, they know each other, if you promote one, what is he or she supposed to do at this point? If the advice is that you should not be friends, you cannot be friends and be their supervisor at the same time. And what do you do? You stop being friends at this point. If that is true, do you not promote from within? None of it makes sense. It's ridiculous. It's 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 a cop out. It's weak minded. The idea that you can't show genuine concern for people, be friendly, and even call them your friend and be their supervisor is ridiculous. Of course, of course you can. And anybody that's a parent knows that you can love your children and be friends with your children and still be in charge of your children. In fact, you probably do a lot better at shaping, helping them grow into the people that they should be because you do care about them because you have genuine concern. So we teach and listen, this was not my idea. This is what the research showed. The people that we talked to that were building successful, resilient teams, that what they were telling us is that you, if you want to build the kind of team that's going to work together through it, work for you through adversity, you work through a tough time at work, you make your boss look really good. People don't go an extra mile. They don't give the extra effort for people that don't care about them. So this is just a fact of... This is a fact of life. And I, sometimes people tell me, I've heard people say, I demand 100% out of my people. And I chuckle and I say, oh, bless you, that's cute. You can demand 
100% all you want, but giving you 100% is an individual choice. And the fact is you can't tell the difference between 90% and 100%. I lead a pretty big team right now. I can't tell the difference between 90 and 100, but the difference between 90 and 100 could be the difference between the team being able to overcome adversity. If, if you have a if you have a team of, of 10 people and they're all giving 90% instead of 100, that's like missing a person and you wouldn't even know it. And so you need everybody to give 100%. You don't demand it. You inspire them you, to give it. You got to get you, you create the environment where they want to where they want to give it. There may be a number of reasons why they don't give it. It may not all even be up to you. It could be a, a lots of other reasons why they don't. But the point that I'm making is that it's a decision on their part to give 100%. So when I hear things like you can't be you can't be friends, you can't got to keep this line somewhere. And listen, there is a line, of course there is. It's it, there's but there's a they are not mutually exclusive. There is a and the more senior you become, of course, the more friendly you can be with your with your by the senior levels of the military, the senior levels of any organization, the higher it goes up the leaders tend to get more and more friendly with their bosses. They know more about them personally, about their families, and they may do things to so host function mm -hmm. to the house for a barbecue and those kind of things. That's not only, it isn't there is some point in time where you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to do that as a frontline supervisor. So I would encourage any head cashier out there to get to know, show some genuine concern for the people that you're in charge of at work. L learn about them, what makes them tick, why, what motivates them to come to work, what future they see for themselves and their family and so forth. Because that, when you do, those folks are going to be much more inclined to give that extra effort that that you cannot demand that they will consciously make a decision to give. And nobody works hard for somebody that doesn't care about them. It, not for very long. They may, I'm certain somebody can give me examples where they did work very hard. for. Well, they have to do it care. in spite of it. They yeah, have to, they, they have. It, it wasn't enduring. It didn't last. You're probably, if you did it, if you did it, you're probably not still doing it. And if you're doing it right now, I bet you're looking for some way to, to get out of it, mm -hmm. to find another place to work. And so I hear, so I do hear some, I hear people, people bash meetings. They hate meetings. It's funny. The same people that post that they hate meetings also post that they love collaboration. So I say, make up your mind. We look, we, I enjoy, we enjoy meetings here at RBLP because our meetings are purposeful. I think what people mean is they hate useless meetings. They hate meetings that are don't go from three o'clock to six o'clock on the experiential learning cycle. They hate meetings that are wasteful where a decision was not made. I get that, but uh, don't hate the meeting. Hate the hate the result. Meetings are meetings can be good. Get together, meet with your team, and talk. Have constructive dialogue and talk about the problems and the issues and how can you improve and how can you innovate? What can we do to move the ball forward and then make decisions on that? Those are good meetings. People, meetings are not inherently bad. And I think people that bash meetings are just not leading good meetings or not, not going to good meetings. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're a hundred percent right. The meetings component is definitely how they're led. And I think that experiential learning cycle is a, is a huge way to shift the way that people experience that event. I hope that there is there are some army regulation writers out there that are listening right now. <laughs> because not even just for the meetings, but for the fraternization policies. And so they actually write into the regulation that you're not allowed to fraternize or to spend time with the people that you work with outside of work unless you invite 100 percent of the people and it has to be like an event which right. negates the idea of establishing like a unique individual bond you know, or a friendship and so i actually got i had an opportunity when i went intel for the 82nd to to ride this line on the side of not violating the regulation is that I've reclassed, right? So I was an E5 sergeant when I transitioned from air defense into intelligence. And so when I went to the Intel school, I went to that school with all of the guys fresh out of basic. They just finished basic and then they showed up at the Intel school to go through the training. I went to the same training. It's a brilliance at the basics. I had to get the basics down before I could go right. into the job. They can't just throw me in a high advanced level just because I was a leader. So there, I met a lot of 
I met a lot of those students and a lot of those guys ended up going to the 82nd Airborne and some of them ended up going into my specific brigade. And so they, they were, I was at brigade level and one of them was in the military intelligence company, which belongs to the engineer battalions, at least at that time. And so what they, the MICO, the military intelligence company would often work directly with the brigade intelligence department to on various intel pro- projects and products so i remember there was one guy in particular that i ended up developing like a pretty good friendship with and i was able to actually hang out with him outside of work even though he was a joe he was a private and i was an nco because we weren't in the direct line of like leadership and hierarchy together and i'll say that like to your point there are lines and there are boundaries and it's the leader's responsibility to ensure that those aren't crossed and that the boundaries are made clear and that was i remember there was i don't remember specifically what was going on but i it was i had to task some of the guys that had come up i'm like all right you're gonna do this you're gonna do that and you're gonna do this you're gonna write the report on this country you're gonna do it on this enemy force and yada yada and the guy was on the team at the time and he looks at me and he's like it just he didn't say anything. He just looked at me like, really? You're gonna make me do that? And I was like, yeah, and I'll make it worse. And I, I said that to him out loud without him even saying it. I was like, yeah, I'll make it worse. If anything, I'll haze you harder than I will right. the other people because of this relationship. And honestly, and it's not even because I'm trying to make sure that I'm above the fray, it's because I know you and I want to push you. I want to see you successful. So yeah, you're probably going to get one of the worst, harder assignments, but it's because I want to push you to be even better than you are. And so it's, there's, there are lines and some people, and this goes into the idea of like conscientiousness, like your level of conscientiousness and your ability to embrace or refrain from those kind of negative interactions some that i think that there's like a direct or there's a closely inverse tie between those if you're high in conscientiousness then your ability to work effectively as a leader through the ranks goes is not like you're gonna have a harder time because you're always trying to please people and i i have that too and that's why i even with that event i had to i game plan that out ahead of time Like I thought I had to because, and so you have to know yourself as a leader. I think that's one of the important aspects of it. Yeah, I think in the military, probably some folks, and there's a boundary, there are lines. It's the senior person's responsibility to establish it and maintain it and figure out what's appropriate. But the fact is you must show genuine concern for your people. In doing so, you're going to get to know them. You're going to get friendly and and so you have to figure out how to balance both of those. And is it going to be difficult? Well, certainly it can. The I think with the fraternization rules in the military, I think are are saying, listen, it's it, this is difficult to do. It's difficult to establish the boundary, to establish the line, and because it's difficult, we don't even want. We're not even going to allow you to try it. We're going to establish a rule that actually prevents you from figuring out how to do that. Most Commanders in the military have a senior enlisted advisor, and most are very friendly with that person. They know them very well. And so it's obvious at some point that it becomes okay to do, not only okay to do, it becomes important, imperative to do, probably better to get leaders used to doing that earlier rather than later. And that's what I, that's what I think about (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know how you show Jen. I mean, I, I'm familiar with the fraternization rules in the military, but I think they're I think they're mainly used. I think everybody knows that people are cr- are violating that rule as mm-hmm. strictly written. Everybody knows, that. and the, I think those rules are probably used as a pulled out when needed. When somebody, when the relationship goes wrong, when people cross the line, then they pull that rule out to say you shouldn't have been doing it to begin with. Yep. Knowing full well that off, junior officers are going right up to that line, they, they're doing it actually, and so the rule is there to use against the people that that don't do it well instead of let's train folks on how to mm-hmm. do it better. I think, and that because in the it's just impo- it's uh, it just makes it very difficult 
to get, you want to show genuine concern. You have to know, you have to know your people that work for you. You have to know what makes them tick. You have to know what drives them to a meaning, what their definition of a meaningful, productive future for themselves is and their family is. And that's why people go to work is to improve their future. And so if it's good to know what a person's, what they see for themselves in the future and how work, the work that they're doing on your team is helping them get to that future. But if you're creative, you might be able to help them get there by encouraging individual learning, by by helping them align their personal goals with the team's goals. And the only way it's, it's that's the second leader task in the provide purpose competency domain is to show genuine concern right after analyze individual purpose, which means, which is saying as an introduction to this idea that people go to work to, to find, to make a better future for themselves, that they want to be challenged. They want to grow personally and professionally. It's not just about the organization. People leave organizations that they love all the time because they're not being challenged to grow personally or professionally, or they don't see a future for themselves in that organization. Great organizations like the military and the big national nonprofits like the Red Cross, where I worked at for a time, people leave great organizations all the time if they're not being challenged, if the work that they're doing doesn't somehow fit into to what they their purpose which is gonna, which is gonna be about their their future, their family's future. You've done it again, Gene. You've done it again. <laughs> you walked me right into. So, all right, we have less than ten minutes left, and this is the last point that I want to make before we kind of circle back to RBLP. Okay. And we hit that. So, you do, you do right into it. This is so incredible. <laughs> I can't believe consistently for two hours that you've done this. Your uh, the idea you just the first two tasks, leadership tasks that you talked about, dive directly into this idea. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you or bring up the topic of the increased level of quit rates coined as like the great resignation and things of that nature. And one of the things that I promote obviously is that effective communication, but building that sense of trust and belonging. And I think that the impact of the genuine concern of identifying a genuine concern for people is it's not that it has to be People can see the word concern and construe it as like this negative, like I'm worried about you, but it's more, I'm concerned with your development. I'm concerned with your progression. I like, I just, it's not, it doesn't have to be a negative association. And but right. when you're having these a genuine concern mentality and you're communicating, right. You're, and you're learning about them individually as a person and beyond just the employee that you hire to fulfill this task, it does a couple of things. And one of which, which is important to an organization who's looking to improve upon their retention rates through resilience practices, is one, you have to realize that you're not going to keep everyone forever. That's just not going to happen, especially in this day and age. It's going to, it's the timelines are getting reduced and that's fine. But you have to, so what this does is one, your leaders are becoming more in tune with what it is those individuals desire. Do they desire to grow in this position? Do they not have an interest in maybe they're a sales rep, they got hired as a sales rep because that's what they've done, but they have no interest in doing sales. If you know that, okay, what are you interested in? Oh, I'd actually really like to do marketing. I'd love to be the head of marketing somewhere. I'm like, oh, those tie together quite nicely. I can help provide a track for that rather than having you sitting there and festering this resentment. Of, oh, I'm doing this job and the money's good and that's fine. And But I have no path towards the thing I want. And how could you develop a path for somebody and what they want if you don't know? <laughs> if right. you don't know what they want, and the only way that you know is by communicating with them. And one of the team that I have here at RBLP is not the team that I had four years ago. It's not even the team that I had four months ago. And I think sometimes people think that there's this requirement to keep every part of getting, showing genuine concern, getting to know your people, setting high standards, all of these things, working through the experiential learning cycle. One of the, one of the, byproducts of this is that you in the you constant part of learning and growing as a team is also getting the right people on the team i like sports analogies i'm a dodgers fan a season ticket holder the the team that the dodgers start off with on day one will not be the team that they go into the playoffs with and during the off season when they really have a time to reflect on the experience of the season before 
and make decisions about team composition and then take action to trade, send some back down to the minors is a necessary part of reaching the goals that they want to get to. And leaders, particularly the more senior you get, where you have the ability, some frontline supervisors don't have a lot of choice in what their team looks like. As you become a middle manager and a senior leader, you have a lot more discretion what your team looks like. And the goal, your role is to get to, is to achieve goals in the, for the a sports team. It's to win the championship, win the World Series, what it, whatever, depending on the sport. The goal is not, the requirement is not to get there with the team that you had on day one. And so that's a hard That's a harsh reality, but it is what it is. And so not everybody. So part of this process, showing genuine concern, getting to know your people is that you may figure out that folks aren't a good fit or they're going to be great on another team, but maybe not your team. They they might be great in another organization, but not necessarily your organization. Some baseball players get traded away and do wonderful things at their new club. And that's great and good for them good for the new club, good for the old club. And so there's, so that's, that, that's part of so There's quiet quitting. I think hey, maybe it's not all a bad thing. If people aren't happy where they're at, if they're not, if the kind of the, the adversity, you know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen sort of thing, that's a byproduct of this sometimes in pursuit of excellence and pursuit of competitive advantage in whatever field you're in is so there's a little goodness in, in in some of that, I think the key is to, you don't want to lose the good ones. You don't want to, what's bad is when you lose the ones that you want, but attrition in terms of people leave people. It also, and it's not a bad thing. People go to, people have a purpose for going to work. And sometimes their purpose with the future that they see for themselves changes along the way. And with their future no longer aligns with current organization that they're in. And it may be time for them to move on to the next thing. And that's not a bad thing. You can celebrate that and appreciate the work that was done up until that point. And the, they're going to go on and do great things in another in an org, in another organization. That happens. It's nobody's, it's just human nature. Things change. People, you were in the military. You didn't stay. I'm sure you enjoyed your time in, but there came a point in time where your role there, your purpose for going to work, going to work, support in the army, didn't support the future that you saw for yourself. And at that point, it became time to leave. Doesn't mean that you stopped liking the army (laughs) or that you're ever going to, or that you didn't enjoy your time there. It just means that you've grown over time and it's, it was time for you to, it was time for you to move on. So, yeah, no, I think the idea of quiet quitting is funny just because it's, if you have a process and a system for connecting and showing genuine concern for your people, you'll, you're never going to have a quiet quitter because it will never be quiet. I'm not saying that they won't ever lose motivation. And oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. The quit may happen, but it won't be quiet. We'll know why. Yeah. And it's if once you, you get left of the bang, so to speak, like right. we would say in the military, you always want to get left of the negative event and plan from there right. means going before it. And it gives you that insight. If you're connecting with them, then you're, you know them better and you're able to say, okay, this is the things are changing. This person's right. attitude is changing because you're connected. So yeah. I think if you're doing these things, if you're RBLP certified, then you're going to identify these things before they happen by the very nature of the tasks that you list out. And on that note, <laughs> <laughs> what give us the kind of last spiel, maybe is like the first thing again in the back, but give us the brief synopsis of the impact of RBLP and where and how people can learn more and join this community. Yep. To find out more about us and what we're doing, you can visit our website. It's easy to find. If you type RBLP into a search engine, you'll find hundreds of hits about the company. You'll you'll end up on our webpage. You can go to rblp.com and then that'll get you there as well to redirect to our main website. So go to the website, learn a little bit about it. The curriculum is hung on the website, our list of partners, colleges, university, leadership coaches, and training companies that do the training uh, is easy to find on our site. 
And if you want to talk to people that have been trained and certified to get from them, they're easy to find as well. You can go to LinkedIn, type in RBLP, click the people tab. There's over a thousand results. You may already be connected to some of those people. If you are, I would encourage you to ask them what they thought. And if you're not, then simply connect with them and see what they thought. Find some people that are in your line of work or have the same interests, maybe that have changed jobs recently and talk to them about that experience and whether the training has helped them. That's how you that's how you find out about us. Again, what we're doing, our mission is to certify leaders, to issue those certification exams that the public can know what it is that, that they're brilliant at the basics and these competencies. And you can rest assured that they know this very well because they demonstrated it on an oral exam. So you can expect a lot of them if they're in your workplace and I think, I think that and out our app as well. That's another way I suppose to, to find out about us is to just type in RBLP in the Apple store, the Google store, whatever those stores are called. Apple I app literally store. did it. Apple wow. app store and yeah. Google play, I think is what they're, <laughs> is yes. what they're called. But you can, you can, you can find out a little bit about us in there too. And listen, I appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. You're a great, a great podcast host, good questions. And that I had the same feel that, that, that went very well. It seemed like we were in sync. Absolutely. Oh, Total great vibe. And I can't recommend RBLP enough. Like this is an incredible program. There's no possible way. I so I say this to my kids again all the time. And this happened to my daughter. She was snowboarding or she was skiing. One of the two. Gosh, my memory's terrible. <laughs> so, so we were going down a mountain. It was her first time ever, ever snowboarding. And she fell down about five times and she was she got to a point when she was sitting there and like kind of tears are starting to come down she's just not necessarily in pain yeah her butt hurt for sure but (laughs) it's just pure level of frustration and she's i just want to take the board off and just walk down like i'm just i'm done i don't want to do it anymore and i told her and i was like hey listen that's an option that is something that you can do but I want you to think about six months from now, two years from now, when you reflect back on this and you think about your time in snowboarding, like how this is how your decision right now is going to impact the memory for the rest. This is your first time snowboarding ever. So what's the impact that it's going to have on you when you make this choice? And she was like, okay, I'll snowboard down. (laughs) (laughs) Because I I like there's I told her there's never going to be a point. This is why I brought the story up. There's never going to be a point in time in your life when you look back and say, God, I really shouldn't have snowboarded down the rest of that mountain. I really shouldn't have done it. And I feel the same way. This is like the least strong argument that I can make is that you're there's never going to be a point in your life as a leader, as a human, where you think, God, that wasn't worth it. I just didn't get much out of it. And it's just another one of those hokey core. It's, I'm telling you people, it's not. And I have many raving reviews about my guests because I only bring on people that I believe in. And I, but this is on a different level because this isn't just somebody's idea. This isn't somebody's book. This is a comprehensive certification program that you can, that will change the way that you operate around others in a group and it will do it for the better. You will be better. The people around you will be better and the trajectory of your professional career can, and I dare say will change when you take this. And this is a, this is true as exhibited by and as evidenced by the people that you were talking about dr gina about the people who said that even in the interview process they saw a difference and not from the certification being listed on there but from what the type of examinations that you guys do what that afforded them to be able to communicate about these things in a way where the people hiring are like, oh my gosh, yes, we have to have this person. We need this in our organization. So it's whether organizations know it or not, they want this. And so you have a chance to get it, to be a part of it. Me as a last final kind of nuanced plug, 
me as a veteran who's currently using his GI Bill to study industrial and organizational psychology. One, I, Dr. Gene and I are going to be working together to bring RBLP into the university that I'm attending here on Long Island, St. Joseph's University. Don't track me down, or you can. Find me if you're around. That's cool. I'm totally fine with that. But So we're going to be looking to bring it there, but he's got it in all of these different colleges and universities across the country. And like he said, check out rblp.com in order to find those. But we're, this is how much I believe in it, is that I have no no, as much as I, I lament the decisions of my past, I have no financial stake in this organization, but I will be going out of my way to to bring it into the organization that I'm a part of because I want to be a part of it. I want to, I'm going to use my GI bill. And this is the thing for veterans is that you can use the cool, you can use the GI bill in order to fund the cost of the certification. And, and so if you work at a big company, most of them have education benefits. And this is exactly the type of, exactly the type of training and certification that they'd like you to use those benefits on. And they generally leave it up to each individual to pick how they want to use their tuition assistance or education benefit, whatever they refer to it as. I'd encourage folks to take a look at, uh, I think, the return on investment, and particularly it's your boss's money. It's uh, I think you'll find, I think you'll be happy that you did it. And because you'll be doing a better job in the workplace, your employer will be glad that they invested in you. That's huge. That's huge. Thank I can't thank you enough for g- spending this time with us. This was- Thanks, Matt. This I was appreciate awesome. it. Have a good one. Take care.